You are listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson, exploring biblical prophecy for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Shalom, Havarin Shalanu. That means peace to you, our friends, in Hebrew. This is Keith Johnson with Nehemia Gordon, ready to take another peek into the prophets to see if we can find some more pearls to share with you. Shalom, Haver Shali. Ata Muchan, are you ready? Ani Muchan, Keith, shalom. What does Ani Muchan mean, Nehemiah? I am ready. <laughs> we are ready. Folks, I'm uh, really <clears throat> excited that we're now on our fourth uh, Prophet Pearls. It's 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 something that's really been uh, motivating me and exciting me, Nehemiah, to, to know that what we're doing primarily is focusing on the Word of God. Yeah. I have to say, though, um, we're, we are uh, recording this early, and uh, I've been gone this weekend. I just got back to you. You picked me up at the airport and as soon as I landed, I received a message that just has been very difficult for me. Hopefully by the time uh, you all are hearing this, uh, this will be um, better than it is today. Uh, but I got a message about my friend Yehuda Glick, Rabbi Yehuda Glick, who actually had an attempted assassination in Jerusalem, um, primarily because of his involvement in uh, calling for the freedom to pray on the Temple Mount. Uh, this has been something that's a very big deal. We don't know by the time this, this show actually um, airs what the situation will be, but would you agree over the last 24 hours it's been a pretty major uh, major development? Oh boy, um, it's really un- unprecedented for um, an Israeli public figure like that to be, um, for an assassination attempt to be carried out. It happened once before and it led to a war. Mm. Um, so this is a really big deal in general, but also because of who he is, because he's fighting for Jewish rights. He's a Jewish rights activist and a right for, for any non-Muslims to pray on the Temple Mount. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I had an encounter with him uh, in 2014. It really changed a lot of the focus, even for myself in, in ministry. He and I hooked up for the Freedom to Pray movement. Uh, there's so many things that we got a chance to do together. I'm, I personally uh, really, really touched uh, by this and, and have been in prayer. And people around the world are actually praying for his recovery. As I mentioned, by the time this show comes up, it's our hope that uh, that he will be uh, up and around and doing better and and back to work. And of course, it just also reminded me just how important the issue is and how controversial the issue is, which is always something you've talked to me about, uh, Nehemiah. But you you said something interesting just about the way that the response, all the way up to Netanyahu himself, uh, why, why, why it was a different issue now um, on how they would see, see Yehuda now versus maybe before this happened. Well, so, so again, he's a public figure in, in Israel and he was attacked in the heart of Jerusalem with a targeted assassination. Now, to be honest, and, and this is a sad thing to say, if he had been walking down the street and a bus blew up and he was killed, um, there'd be a different sort of, it would be you know, a response, but it wouldn't be the same sort of response. Mm-hmm. In fact, for Israel, this response is, maybe we've gotten used to that, I hate to say that, it's, it's mm-hmm. sad to say, but whereas this is, wait, you're going to target a specific person for a political assassination in our capital, yeah, I mean that no country could tolerate that. Yeah, you know it's it's. Uh, I'm, I haven't processed it. Hopefully, by as mentioned, by the time uh, they listen to this, I will have processed it better. But you know, one of the things that I was doing with him over this last year was assisting him in terms of being able to use the gift that I've been given and the ability we've been able to use to for videos and that sort of thing to help him in sending his story. And we did a really powerful um, challenge to people. But more than that, Nehemiah, I was working with him on a, a specific uh, project uh, that no one's seen any of the, the, the footage mm. of that. And I just have to be honest with you, the place that he was uh, assassinated at was the focal point of the project uh, mm. that I'm working on uh, with him. And of course, that place is Bible Hill. Right. People it's, think it's really a symbolic Vegas place. Yeah, yeah, it's a symbolic place. So just a little bit on that before we get started. So uh, it's known in Israel as Givat HaTanach, uh, Bible Hill. And the reason it was one of the reasons it was originally called that is that it's the only hilltop in Jerusalem that's still pristine. Every other hilltop in the Jerusalem region has been uh, quote unquote developed, meaning they've built modern houses on it and things like that. And you could walk up to the top of Bible Hill and it looks today the same as it did in the time of King David. Mm-hmm. And the second reason is the oldest passage they ever found of, any, of, of the Bible the, were these two silver scrolls, the famous silver scrolls that I talk about in Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence. I think mm-hmm. you talk about that mm-hmm. as Hallowed Name Revealed again, too. Mm-hmm. They're really significant scrolls. They're on display at the Israel Museum, and they were discovered there on Bible Hill, right behind the Begin Center, where um, where Yehuda Glick was shot. Mm-hmm. And uh, and the Begin Center is on the downward slope of Bible Hill. So, mm-hmm. I mean, it's all the same place, all mm-hmm. within you know uh, less than a hundred feet of 
of each other. All these things. I, I can, I'm, I'm, I'm humbled. Uh, one that he, he's uh, reached out, and we were able to walk together as friends. I'm saddened by the situation with him. I'm motivated to be able to eventually get this message out because it's such a powerful message that uh, he and I were able to walk together this process. And of course, it's happening at that place has been uh, been difficult. Again, hopefully by the time this is out, we we will have been speaking to him, and he'll. Uh, hopefully he'll be be able to maybe be a guest in one of our audio blogs uh, get him back again he's he's been on a few of them um, anyone that's interested in, on the story about Yehuda Glick can go to bfainternational.com go to blogs and you can go down and you'll hear you see pictures of me and him together and and uh, just amazing so uh, by God's grace uh, let's say a prayer for the peace of Jerusalem yeah you know uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu he he made a public statement saying Yehuda <laughs> we're all praying for the shalom, the peace of Yehuda and Yehovah, please give healing to this man, Yehuda, this man of peace who just wanted to pray to you on the place where you put your name forever. Mm. Um, Father, give peace to your people Israel and your city Jerusalem and mm. all those who call upon your name in truth. Amen. Amen. First Kings chapter one. We're in Prophet Pearls. Now our fourth uh, episode of Prophet Pearls. Yeah. Um, I want to say that it's uh, been humbling to have some people come alongside that have helped us um, uh, be producers. This is not one of those episodes that we have a producer for. So the good news is we're going to keep doing it. And the better news is that Nehemiah and I are sponsoring it oh. ourselves. <laughs> so let's get what? <laughs> right into it. First Kings chapter 1. When King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm even when they put covers over him. So a servant said to him, let us look for a young virgin to attend the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our Lord, the king, may keep warm. Nehemiah, we're, um, we're, 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 I just have to be honest with you. When I was studying this passage, <laughs> this verse jumps off the page to yeah. me. And why did it jump off the page? And I want to know whether what the tradition is. What you think well, the tradition is? We've got to why... go through verse four to have that full discussion. Okay, can we do that? Well, we can get to verse four, but I want okay. I want to say something. Yeah. So before we get to verse four, um, why do you think I got excited about verse one? Because she was a Shunammite. No, not because she's a Shunammite. Oh, that's sorry. Verse that's, one, Nehemiah. Yeah. What does verse one say? Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah. So what you? What you I got excited because this is the this is the beginning of the chapter yeah. that was on my test. When we went through the, uh, oh, when we went through the, really? yes, I don't absolutely, remember, I don't, I don't remember. remember. Wasn't hey, that folks, like over ten years yeah, ago? It was, but the test was years ago? the one of the longest chapters in the Torah. It's Genesis chapter twenty-four. Oh, okay, and so Genesis yeah. chapter twenty-four opens up the same with the exact in the exact phrase, and oh. so I'm wondering why when they picked this passage, uh, when I saw that phrase, I immediately thought to myself, I think this is one of the reasons. Now, before you start tapping. Before you st- no, he's already tapping, folks. He's already got to be on the road. Tell the people what you're talking okay, about. Okay, so the, the so the beginning of the phrase in uh, so in, this is a prophet portion. Yes, a traditionally read prophets portion that corresponds to a Torah portion. Absolutely, and that Torah portion is the portion of Vayera. Yeah, and, and that and, is um, chapter eighteen through twenty two. Mm-hmm. So that doesn't have the section you're talking about. <laughs> no, 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 no. So in the the the, the, the Torah, the portion that we're looking at. Is that not Vayera? Am I in the wrong one? Do we have to edit this out? <laughs> no, right one. Folks, we're confused. <laughs> no, it's the it's the fourth one. There's yes. Bereshit, Noach, Lechicha, and um, Vayera. So this is the. <laughs> We're starting this whole thing over again. <laughs> no, no, no. No, this is important. It is. It's the fourth one. So this is the one that corresponds not with Genesis 24, which is what yes. you were looking for, but Genesis 18 to 22. Oh. Genesis 23. Edit that out. <laughs> no, no, don't edit it out. Have it. No, it's, wait, this is the fifth episode we're doing? This is what I'm trying to tell you. I said oh, I thought we are on the fourth episode. Hey, okay. folks, we're just, you know, it's difficult. No, but no. So again, the, the section that's connected <laughs> with this is is the fifth episode is the fifth episode okay Genesis 23 to 25 23 1 to 25 oh, okay. 18 now so why did I get excited okay. Nehemiah? because that first phrase which we find in Genesis chapter 24 now while you're looking in your computer so it's not Vayera it is Chaye Sarah mm-hmm. the life of Sarah yes and uh, okay so here so can I can I do something so what I had to do I want to tell you guys about how tough my teacher was he picked the longest chapter in the Torah am I right or wrong Genesis I twelve. Don't know that it's the longest. Absolutely, in the Torah. it is. I checked it my, for myself. It's the longest chapter. Is there one in Numbers that has a whole bunch of numbers. No, this is long. Genesis. I'm going to argue it. How many in, verses is it? It's like fifty some verses. If you if, if you look at it, it's like uh, 
It's uh, Genesis 24 goes all the way to 67 verses. Mm, <laughs> okay, well, so let me just tell you while he's while he's tapping. Right, yeah. So he, he he has this this passage and he says, okay, this is going to be your test. And the test was, I needed to know everything about that particular passage in Hebrew. So I had to read it in Hebrew, understand yeah. it, and then you'd ask all of these questions that were grammatical questions. And I just have to say, Nehemiah, how much I appreciated that process. It was difficult. You were tough. But but again, one of the lines that jumped out in Genesis chapter 24, verse 1, and I'm just throwing this out as a possibility. says, says, Abraham zachen babayamim, and Abraham was old or advanced in days. So when we get to 1 Kings, it says what? Look, 1 Kings chapter 1. If I turn real quickly while you're tapping your computer, let's see who finds it first. <laughs> and it goes, and we're racing. They're off to the races. What are we and, looking for? <laughs> and I get to 1 Kings. Here I am. 1 Kings, it says, uh, the David, ah, Bahamelech David zaken ba bayamim. So I get this yeah. phrase, okay? Zaken ba bayamim, and immediately I'm thinking I must be like changing because think of this. Mm -hmm. I'm reading the Hebrew of First Kings, and I think of the phrase in Hebrew from Genesis chapter 24. Mm. So I'm looking at this phrase, and I'm just throwing this out. Is this one of the reasons that there's a connection between this passage being selected? There's the concept, of course, of David being old, Abraham being old, Sarah. Obviously, uh, the life of the, uh, the death of Sarah. But when this phrase comes out, for me, I thought of Genesis when mm. I read First Kings because the phrase is exact. Then I looked through it and I thought, wait, where else do we see this phrase? So we also see this phrase in Joshua, I believe it is. Zaken uh, ba mm. We see it in Moses. I'm sorry, in Genesis with Abraham. We see it with Joshua, I believe, twice, and then we see it uh, with King David. Now, all of this is for me to say to you, I think there's a conversion process going on in terms of my thinking that when I'm reading in English, it's something that maybe I wouldn't have noticed. But when I read it in Hebrew, that phrase, and I'm, I don't know what it was like for you growing up in the synagogue, but aren't there Hebrew phrases that when you hear them, you're immediately reminded of other phrases? I mean, isn't that oh, kind yeah. of... Oh, yeah. We talked last week about, you know, where they come and they say, La ma'od hazet, this appointed time. You know, according to the time of life. I mean, you can't hear that and not have the association with, um, you know, the, the event that took place with, you know, with with um, Sarah. Yeah. And then later you have the same thing going on with, you know. Exactly. So I want to say to folks, you know, we, this really is a process, a genuine process of chavruta, as you say, friends back mm -hmm. and forth. And normally what we would have done is we'd have our editors come and edit all of this process out. We don't have any editors. We just got one that takes care of what we do. But Nehemia, I want to say, isn't it kind of cool that we can show the human side of the, searching through the scriptures yeah. and not always having it all together? But I mean, we're we're sincerely looking into the passages yeah. and, and seeing, and, and we're also doing some stuff ahead of time, which is, is is a little bit of a challenge in terms of dates, mm -hmm. like which date we're on. Are we in the fifth week or the sixth week? All right, so, that's because people were pre-recording these episodes. Yeah, so before Keith disappears into the other side of the world. <laughs> yeah, um, and plus, it's a chance. When we're physically together, that's actually, yeah. I enjoy it. I, I have more fun. Yeah. So, okay, that's, I wanted to bring that up. Let's move on to the, yeah. to the part you want to talk about. His servant said to him, let us look for a young virgin. Got to stop. Yeah. Is that word virgin the same word that's, uh, that we've seen as, as virgin in, in uh, Isaiah 7, 14? The virgin shows, can, can you look, can you tap on your, tap on your computer real quick? I just want to know if the word virgin is the same. If that's the same word as that, you want me to look in the King James I, version? Oh, you can look in the there King it's James. Be the same. Okay, awesome. Look in the King. No, I want you to look in the, the Hebrew, Hebrew. In the Hebrew, it's obviously not. It's, it's well obviously known, not. Well now, wait a minute. Now, I want to be fair now. Yeah. So, if someone's reading in Genesis, yeah. uh, I'm sorry, in, in Isaiah 7:14, yeah, and they're reading in First Kings chapter one, and in the English version it says virgin, could they not assume that that is the same Hebrew word? They could assume, but they, they would be wrong. Okay, so, and so can you tell us what the two different words are? So the are? word in uh, Kings is, uh, the, in the passage we're reading, is bitula, mm -hmm. and that's the word for virgin. That's legitimately what the word is yeah, for virgin. And, and if you want more details, look in Deuteronomy where where it, it has kind of a graphic explanation of what that is. Okay. Yep. Um, it talks about a woman the yep. day after her, her uh, wedding, and they bring out a sheet that has certain signs that she was a virgin the okay. night before. Um, so it's it's... You know, quite it's quite you know technically a virgin, mm -hmm. and then Isaiah seven fourteen has the word alma, which means young woman. But you know, just to read from like for example the New Revised Standard Version, which is a Christian translation made by the like the United Council of Churches or something like that, 
it there has the young woman. So mm-hmm. the young woman is with child and she'll bear a son and she'll name him Emmanuel. That's in the Christian translation. Sure. And the reason I bring that up... Because they know in the Hebrew it says Alma. So I wanted, the reason I bring that up, though, is that oftentimes... Yeah. Um, at a casual reading of scripture in, yeah. in the English version, you don't always see those differences. Yeah. For me, when I come across that word virgin, the first thing I thought was, just from my background, is I just want to see, yeah. is it the same word? And come to find out it wasn't the same word. Yeah. In fact, we then find out, it says here, it says she was actually a young, it says, does it not say she was a young um, Betula? So in other words, a young woman who was a virgin. She, uh, a young girl who was a virgin. Yeah. Not okay. A betula. Okay, awesome. So let us look for a young woman, the king, and take care of him so you can lie beside him that our Lord the king may keep warm. Now, Nehemiah, I want to do something really interesting. I want you to look, I, and this can, is just. Can we get to verse 4, though? Oh, we, we got to do verse 4. We, we got to do it. Okay, go. You read verse 2 already. Well, well, verse 2 in the King James Version oh. says something that I just yeah. wanted, to, I wanted to notice. Okay. What you, go to the King James Version. The King James Version. Okay. Pull that up here. You have to go to the King James Version. Computer. Yeah. And I love the phrase at the end. What does it say? That my lord, the king, may get heat. <laughs> may may got heat. <laughs> I mean, this is which which, which 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 how does it say it there? It says here may get heat. Wait, may get heat. Okay, well, well yours says may got heat. Yeah, what's the? So they've modernized. They modernized it, but anyways, but anyways, it I thought yeah. it was a really really cool phrase. All right, let's go ahead okay. to verse three and four. Yeah, it says, and then, then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful girl and found Abishad a Shunammite. Mm-hmm. The last time we talked about the Shunammite who didn't have a name. This time the Shunammite has a name. She's Abishag and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. She took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no intimate relations with her. And the Hebrew it says, Veloya da'a. He didn't yeah. know her. He didn't know her. So, yeah. you you know, folks, you should know this. Uh, we did have a short conversation before <laughs> we started recording. And uh, I told Nehemiah, I said, that this is an amazing thing. He says, what do you, what do you mean? It's just a matter of that she keeps him warm. Is that, is that what you told Yeah, me? she was cuddling with him she, because he was cold. Okay. So here's what I want you to do. And I don't know the answer to this, but I want you to yeah. tap, tap. This is yeah. what's cool about the computer. Yeah. What's the word they use for uh, for um, saying that she waited on him? What's the word that they use for waited on him? Waited on him. And while you're looking for that, it says here, so his servants, okay, we got about four different things going. Uh, they search for her, and it says, yes, she became the. And here it says in the NASB, she became the 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 king's nurse, mm-hmm. and then served him. So what I wanted you yeah. to look at in verse four is I want you to look for the word served. Mm-hmm. What that what that word would mean, and then also connecting that with the word. That she was the uh, a nurse. The root of that word and how that word might be used. Mm. Because when I looked at that Nehemiah, I thought about as the story progresses, yeah. what was she doing? We understand that he was cold. We understand that she needed to help him stay warm. But if you look at the word itself of what it means to serve him and how that's used, also correct me if I'm wrong. What was Joshua called who helped? Uh, yes, so maybe it used the same word, but the context here is different. I understand, but the what king is the was word? Cold and needed someone to. Okay, so uh, what is, what was Joshua him. called? He was he was a servant. She was serving serving him. He was a minister? Is there an English version that says she that he was that he was ministering? Yeah. He was serving. So it uses the same root, sharat. Okay, tell us what that is. Um, it means to serve. It's, okay. it's you know I don't know that we can define it as as you know precise. Mm-hmm. It, it means different things in different contexts. Okay, awesome. But in this situation, she's basically coming in to do a service. Ultimately, the service, the reason it came up is because yeah. the king couldn't stay warm. Right. right. And it's an interesting thing I remember learning when I was a kid. This is one of these things where, like, you know, we would read a, a verse in the Bible and then we'd read the, the commentary. Read a verse and read the commentary. And then one, you know, eventually, as I've shared before, I decided to read it just by itself without mm-hmm. the commentary. Mm-hmm. But one of the things I remember from these commentaries is, is they ask the question, why was he cold? Oh and, really? And they came with this, uh, you know, a very rabbinical explanation of why he was cold. And they went back to the story in one Samuel twenty-four, where he uh, and I love the story because it takes place at Engedi, hmm. where uh, Saul is chasing uh, David, and they're going through these different wadis, these different nachalim, you know, these different creeks, and it's mountainous. Mm-hmm. And it's very easy to escape there, and, and also for someone to be just around the corner and not see him. Mm-hmm. And so David and his men are hiding in a cave. And Saul and his men come into the same cave, not realizing David's there. Mm-hmm. And Saul falls asleep, and David comes and he cuts his garment. Yes. And he later shows him the garment. He sees, says, see, I could have killed you. Look, check, this is a piece missing from your garment. Mm-hmm. And the story the rabbis tell is that the reason that he couldn't stay warm is because he didn't have respect for clothing. 
And so God was punishing him that uh, cloth would not keep him warm. So he needed flesh to keep him warm. Oh, my goodness. Now, at, growing up, hearing the story, it didn't occur to me because I didn't know that old people get cold <laughs> and can't yeah. keep their warmth. Right. Um, you know, but, I mean, this this was the, the kind of the thinking of the rabbis. And looking back, I say, well, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. Like, mm -hmm. he was cold because he was an old man. It wasn't God's punishment because he cut the garment. Exactly. Um, so in other words, yeah. the, the reason I bring this up, though, is isn't it, isn't it interesting? There always seems to be, well, I shouldn't say always, oftentimes there seems to be the need to try to find something significant beyond the plain reading. In other words, right. the plain oh, well, what they're What they're yeah. doing is reading into it. You yeah, know, reading into what, it. What we're doing is called exegesis, which mm -hmm. is um, uh, reading out, pulling mm -hmm. out the meaning. Mm -hmm. And what the rabbis will do and others will do is called eisegesis, which is reading into it. Mm -hmm. That's from the Greek word ex is out and is in. Mm -hmm. They're reading into it. Mm -hmm. And here they're clearly reading into it. They're looking for some moral, um, you know, uh, ethical explanation of why he was cold instead of the contextual historical reason, because he was, you know, which it says he's an old man. He couldn't, couldn't stay mm -hmm. warm. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, okay. they didn't have heat, heat and blankets and, you know, it was cold. It's a cold place, Jerusalem, relatively speaking. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, so they brought him a woman to lay down and her body heat would keep him warm. Mm -hmm. And then it tells us just so you think, you know, she's laying in bed with him, but she's not having sex with him. Mm -hmm. Um, she has, you know, a functional purpose here. She's, you know, not mm -hmm. doing, mm -hmm. uh, that. And, um, you know, I don't know if it were me, I'd probably just get another Rhodesian Ridge back to lay at my feet. But yeah. Anyway, <laughs> what's well, interesting? I mean, think about back in those days. You just don't turn on a heater. You don't say, "Hey, turn up the heat." I mean, it's cold. It gets into. It's cold. Well, I mean, think just think about this really simple thing. They didn't have windows. Yeah, a window was a hole in in the. I mean, they didn't have windows with glass. Mm -hmm. So you know, let's say you had some kind of opening, and maybe there was like a wooden shutter there or something. You're not really going to keep all the cold out, and it no. can get cold in the winter in Jerusalem. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Well, I'm going to let you have some fun on this next verse. I'm yeah. sure you haven't oh. probably even thought about it because you, yeah. you, you you want to jump. Who knows? You probably have some other pearl. But I have a pearl for you, Nehemiah. What's that? I've got a great pearl You're for give you. Give me a pearl. I'm going to give you a pearl, and, I want, and I'll tell you why, because it's actually related to something that you actually uh, taught me when I was reading this oh, yeah. that, uh, that I had to go and check for myself. And so I did check it for myself. But it has to do with the name of this key, of this of the son of David. So what do you what do you notice? Well, let, let me tell you what I notice. When I see his name, I see in my in my English Bible it says now Adonijah. Okay? Yeah. So I think of Adonijah and I think okay, let me go behind the Hebrew and see what the Hebrew says. But something really interesting <laughs> jumped off the page and it has to do with something that you we we talked about is that people that get caught up in saying, well, the end of his name and if you read oh. it in Hebrew, I think it is uh, Adoniyahu. Am I right? So in this verse, it's Adoni Adoniyah. Yeah. Oh, then and this other Adi verses later, on, it's Adoniyahu. And those Adoniyahu. are actually used interchangeably. Okay. And so what's interesting is about how that's the that's the end of his name. Yeah. Okay. So what do we find out about that being at the end of his name? So why couldn't I just say, therefore, that's showing clearly it's God's name. Okay. I mean, that's the end of his name is... is, is so let's explain to people who yeah. don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. So many Hebrew names are what we call theophoric compound names. Mm -hmm. It's two words that together make a short sentence in Hebrew. And so in this case, Adoni Yahu is Yahu, Yehovah, is my Lord or is Lord. Mm -hmm. So in this verse, we have Adoni Yah, okay? Right. The shortened form of Yah, right. correct? And that Yah still represents the poetic form of God's name. It's definitely what you find at the end of names, yeah. So, so why I got excited about this, and I know we're going to address it again, is that I don't know if there are other passages, maybe there are, yeah. where you have in the same passage, the same person's name mm -hmm. used with the formal, the longer, the longer, and the shortened form mm -hmm. in the same chapter. That's a good question. So the reason I think this is interesting, when we get to the more formal, the longer form of his yeah. name... Uh, and again, so what yeah. you're talking about is... There is Adoniyah and Adoniyahu. And you're saying Adoniyahu is more formal and Adoniyah is more like a And how it's a used is what's really yeah. interesting. And so we'll, we'll get to the verse and we can come back to but it again. But the beauty is that tapping. those really are used interchangeably. Yeah, absolutely. So here's here he is. This is the son whose mother was Hagit. Put himself forward. Put himself forward. What does that mean? <clears throat> so he so now David is old. He's advanced mm -hmm. in years. Obviously, he's going to die. I mean, he's... It's, whether it's going to be a month or six months or a year, I just think it's interesting. David is still king. Am, am I right? Well, he's not dead yet. So, yeah, he's king. So, he's king. So, what is this saying he's putting himself forward? Putting himself forward. What does that mean? I mean, literally saying, I'm, I'm, I'm going gonna, 
I'm going to be the king. Yeah. I mean, that's what he's saying. So here's well, he's jumping the gun. He or, or and also he he you know he knows that he's not supposed to be king. Mm-hmm. Um, that Solomon Shlomo has been appointed has been promised to be king mm-hmm. by David, and so Adoniahu is saying, "Well, wait a minute, I'm older than him, well, you know, and and as the elder, as the elder brother, I should get the I should be king." And that was the you know the thinking. I guess it still is to this day in in monarchies, and um, and so he. You know, he thinks, okay, my father doesn't even know what's going on. He's some old man who, you know, who's laying in bed and is cold, and mm-hmm. I'm just going to make myself king, and that will be a fact. And mm-hmm. and that's one of the things that you know, it's interesting. Like I'll have this conversation about. Uh, yeah, let, let me talk for a minute about. Can I talk for a minute about Jesus? Sure. So, <laughs> I've had this conversation with Christians and Messianics, and, and they're saying, well, we don't understand why the Romans would want to kill him. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 to me, it's studying history. It's obvious because he was proclaiming himself to be king he was claiming to be the son of david the the king Mm -hmm. and the response is well so what and what you have to understand in 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 many cultures even today but definitely in these ancient cultures if you said you were king it might just be true Mm -hmm. and so the romans hearing this would be like well wait a minute we can't have somebody saying we're king we're in charge Mm -hmm. and that's the case here with adoniahu the mere fact that he's proclaiming himself king may make it true Mm. And so that's why there had to be this response from Sal, from Shlomo and, and his mother Batsheva and Natan the prophet. They had to get involved because, wait a minute, you know, you might say, well, wait a minute. So what if he says he's king and he's got 50 people running before him? It doesn't matter. Who cares, right? But no, it, it mattered. Mm-hmm. That, that you know, uh, think about what is the difference between someone who's actually the president and someone who claims to be the president. Mm-hmm. Well, if everybody, if he claims to be the president and everybody accepts it, then by then he is. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Even if he shouldn't be. Even it's interesting you bring that up, Nehemi, because he does something. He does something. It says, "So he got chariots and horses mm-hmm. ready with fifty men to run ahead of him." And when I yeah. read that, I immediately think of Absalom. I mean, who who else did that? Yeah. I mean, in other words, you get the chariots and the men, and you basically say, "Look, I claim myself king, yeah. and I've got the I've got the uh, I've got all the accoutrements that go with being a king. Yeah, yeah. I've got all the you know the flash, the bling." Yeah. So now yeah. here's but here's the thing that threw me off as I was reading the passage is the next line. Mm-hmm. The next line is where I get. I, I had to slow down. I got a little yeah. concerned. Maybe there's something you saw different in this. It says, and it's in, it's in parentheses in, in, in the NIV. It says, It's not in parentheses yeah, in the Hebrew. Yeah, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. His father had never uh, interfered with him by asking, mm-hmm. Why do you behave as you do? What does it say in Hebrew? Would you be willing to show us that? Yeah, it says, Velo atzavo, Aviv. Mm-hmm. His father did not trouble him. Mm-hmm. You know, his father didn't bother him, didn't trouble him. To say, wait a minute, what are you, what are you doing? So, so when that happens, why have you done this? Yeah, yeah. So he doesn't say that to him, and that that's the part that that makes me think. So, 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 what's happening here? It's not the promised. It's mm-hmm. not the promised one. He sees that he's doing the same thing that Absalom did. Mm-hmm. He's got fifty men. He's got the horses, the chariots. He's running. He's, well, and, maybe, and and the key to me is the end of the verse. It says, and he was and he was given birth to or, uh, after Absalom, or she gave birth to him after Absalom. So. So it's really interesting here. You know, there's this pattern of thinking in, in, in the Bible, in the Tanakh, in, mm-hmm. in the Hebrew thought, which is the pattern of three and four. Mm-hmm. Um, if you look, for example, at the book of Amos, which we'll get to, I don't know if we'll get to that section, mm-hmm. it'll talk about, you know, for three sins of, you know, of Judah and for the fourth I will not forgive him, and for three sins of Damascus and for the fourth. So there's this actual thought pattern in ancient Hebrew of the three and the four. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly kind of what's going on here. Um, so who is the first son that... that certainly thought he should be king or, or mm-hmm. acted like a king. That was Amnon, mm-hmm. Amnon. He was the one who had the incident with his sister and he ended up getting killed. Okay, so there's Amnon. And then there's Absalom is number two. Mm-hmm. And Adoniahu is thinking, I'm third in line. I, I, the first, those two guys who were, who, were old, you know, who were more suited than me, mm-hmm. they had their crack. Now it's my turn. Mm-hmm. And I'm older than, than Solomon and Shlomo. Why should he get a turn? Mm-hmm. But what ends up happening is those first three, they... they are the failed kings. They never really become king. And the fourth one <laughs> mm-hmm. becomes king, which is Shlomo. Mm-hmm. Amazing. So it says here, and this is where it, he goes further. Uh, it says he was also very handsome and was born next after Absalom. And then seven, how does it use his name in verse seven? It's Adonia. Uh, it's again Adonia in verse uh-huh. seven. Yeah. All right. So in, in verse seven, it says he conferred with Joab and he also conferred with the priest, and they also and they and they both gave him support. So I wanted yeah. to ask this: when I read that, I thought, so why would these guys immediately do that? 
what would be what would be their thinking? And it, I mean, Joab. I mean, this is the was commander was commander of David's army. What would it be about so, him? So you know, Joab, Joab, he had, he had seen <laughs> for a long time ago that the king wasn't entirely with him, mm-hmm. and it was the situation where Joab was just too powerful to get rid of, mm-hmm. um, and so the king kind of had had a you know step back and and let him do some of the things he did. But for example, we talked about the story of Shimei, and there's an example where you know he says you know you sons of blood you know he refers to these um these these you know the sons of Tria which were you know Yoav and his two brothers um so so he knows that King David isn't entirely you know with him and we see in later chapters that that actually uh proves out that mm-hmm. that um David warns Solomon he says look you've got to you got to do something about this Yoav you know it's funny I was reading Nehemiah before this and that's just, just a question that came up that that, that kind of hit me as I thought okay so what's the last interaction Historically, that we see between David and mm-hmm. Joab, the last time we hear about mm-hmm. Joab's name, and that last conversation that yeah. they have is, and then check me if I'm, check me on this if I'm wrong, but the last conversation that they have, at least biblically, was a disagreement. In mm-hmm. other words, that Joab, David wanted to count the people, and uh, and then Joab said, you know, my king, don't do this, you know, and and they, yeah, I'm not sure. So, so that's the last chapter of two Samuel. And, was that Second Samuel when it was? And, and there's some question about the yeah. chronology of that, mm-hmm. about whether that's actually mm-hmm. the last thing in his kingdom, or mm-hmm. you know. So anyway, but yeah, it's definitely a well. What it, more than it, anything it, it in the sequence that, of the story, there's an, a disagreement. Yeah, yeah. there's something. That, who knows whatever yeah. the issues are that are going on between. But them. actually, in that instance, Joab Joab was was in the right. <laughs> and David oh, was he in, was, but and he, David was in the wrong. But here's the point. So David yeah. was in the wrong. I'm yes. just asking this question. So, is there what? What are the things where Joab is questioning yeah. his 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 uh, questioning his? Uh, but that was a good questioning. The, I think the bigger issue is that he had you know murdered these two people mm-hmm. without the authority of David, and and it made David look bad. These two generals, mm-hmm. and you know, and that later on we see that when David's on his deathbed, like giving his final instructions to Solomon, this is what he brings up. He doesn't mention about the counting. Mm-hmm. He mentions. For the murders of of Amasa and, and Abner, mm-hmm. you know who were you know Abner the general of Israel and Amasa the general of Judah, there's got to be reckoning. Well, for is that. it fair to say this when it's you look back? When you look back and you look forward in the yeah. story, there's definitely this issue between David and uh, this commander. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, so the the commander decides that he's gonna he's gonna follow him along mm-hmm. with the high priest, and so uh, he's he's got a pretty good situation. He's got the he's got the you know the the military. So he thinks the military yeah. backing, he's got the 50 men, he's got the chariots, he's made the declaration, he's next in line, but there's something he was missing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> what was that? And, and even beyond his father not saying anything, there was something even more important that he was missing. What so he, he didn't have the prophet with him. He didn't have the prophet. <laughs> <laughs> and because he didn't have the prophet, he didn't have what else? Whatever God was saying through the prophet. So he's, he's building it up himself. And then... Well, and, and, and the interesting thing is this is one of the few periods in history where we have two high priests side by side mm. so we had Eviatar the priest he didn't have Tzadok or Zadok mm-hmm. the priest mm-hmm. okay yeah now verse 9 now can you take a look and say what name is being used here in verse 9 that's Adoniyahu ah so just so I'm clear in verse 5 it's Adoniyah mm-hmm. in verse 7 it's Adoniyah in verse nine, it's Adoniyahu. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I don't. I mean, maybe we could, we could do this and put it in later. Mm-hmm. But I would really like to find an example where you have a person's name being two different ways in the same passage. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't know. I, that that just kind of jumped off. And and then of course the other thing it says it he then sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves at the stone of Zohelet near Enrogel. He invited all of his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah. Who were royal officials, but so you say, but he but. did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Beniah, or the special guard, or more importantly, even or his brother Solomon. What's he doing, Nehemiah? What's mm-hmm. going on? This is what they call a coup, mm-hmm. a coup d'état. Mm-hmm. He's seizing control of, of the of the kingdom by proclaiming himself king, and like you know, and he he's he's having a coronation ceremony <laughs> and um and wh- where does he go he goes down to the spring of Enrogel mm-hmm. and it's interesting what that spring the name of that spring means do you do tell you, me about that look ah, into that tell me. so so there were two main springs in in ancient Jerusalem and the interesting thing is no one knows exactly where Enrogel is anymore um that spring is dried out mm-hmm. um there is a a, a well that it's a dug well. You know, a spring comes naturally out of the ground. The water oozes out of the ground naturally mm-hmm. in Israel. And a well is something that's actually dug into the ground. 
So there's a well in that area, and some people say originally it was a spring, and, and, and because of an earthquake, it, it stopped putting out water, and so they dug down knowing that they'd reach water. Mm -hmm. uh, but the spring doesn't exist anymore. So the exact location is, is uncertain. Um, but Ein Rogel, <laughs> it's, it's, I love this. So the word Rogel is uh, a word that means slander. Hmm. And so Ein Rogel is the, is the spring of slander. And, um, and how appropriate that he goes down to the spring of slander. There's wow. two springs, and he chose that one to mm. um, proclaim himself uh, king. And there's this great passage where that, it's a pretty rare word, mm -hmm. but it appears in Psalm 15, which is one of my favorite psalms. Mm -hmm. um, let me read it real quick here. It says, um, Yehovah, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He that walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. He that backbiteth not with his tongue. And in the Hebrew it says, Lo He didn't slander with his tongue. Hmm. And I love this because like, like you, you read this psalm and you get the picture. There are these people who are standing, Levites, and they're standing, and this is a psalm of David. There are these Levites who are standing at the entrance of the temple and they're hmm. saying, Who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? And they're saying, Look, if you want to come to this place, this is what you need to live up to. Hmm. You need to be righteous with Jehovah. Don't just come here and bring sacrifices. God doesn't want rivers of oil and, and you know and, and blood, like the prophets say. You need to have this righteousness, and then you can come to this mountain and bring your sacrifices. Wow, amazing. So when I hear En Rogel, the spring of slander, I, I'm reminded of that verse where that word appears. Um, you know, and, and so that's that's where Adoniyahu decided to go to proclaim himself king. Mm. <laughs> Well, so so when we get to verse eleven, you know, I, I always think about this when the, when the prophet shows up. Nathan's just going to show up now. Yeah. In verse eleven, and he goes to Bathsheba, Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, and he says, "Have you not heard that Adoni? Uh, well, I should say in, in my English, uh, I, I, I don't even know how to Adonijah? say Adonijah. Adonijah. <laughs> yeah, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king without our Lord David knowing it. There it's Adoniyahu. Ah, and there's Adoniyahu. Again, yeah. the prophet's using this, the, that uses the full... And, and in Hebrew, Hebrew, there's sort of a... I don't know if it's even a play on words, but there's definitely a ring to this. She says, um, uh, Ki malach Adoniyahu ben Chagit, va Adonenu David lo yada. <laughs> so there's Adoniyahu has done this, and, and our, our Lord, and Adonenu, our Lord David, doesn't know about it. Yeah, it's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, love, I don't know Nehemiah. I just... Like, that I, has a ring to it in yeah, Hebrew that's yeah, lost yeah, it's, in English. Yeah, it's great preaching. If you, Adonenu, our Lord. And by the way, Nehemiah, it, yeah. this is really fo good, folks. We, we've got him into a, a system now where... For the last, uh, for each of the each of the prophet pearls, you've been reading the entire passage yeah. in Hebrew. Um, and actually, I'm really excited. You've been a little bit dramatic about it. <laughs> so when you get to this, when you get to this phrase, we're expecting you to say it like you just said it. We wanted to jump off the page <laughs> that there's a there's a little bit of a. Hello, <laughs> shamata ki malach Adoniyahu ben Chagit vadoneno David lo yoda. There it is. <laughs> have you not heard? Have you not heard? Adoniyahu son of Chagit has reigned and. Proclaimed himself king, and our Lord David doesn't know. And he doesn't know. Wow. So anyway, we're expecting that. Um, let's continue because this is this yeah. this gets interesting. It says, um, "Now then, let me advise you on how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon." In other words, this isn't just an issue of a, a power play. He he wants to be king. He realizes what this means. Oh yeah. If he becomes if, if king, king Solomon's you're done. Gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. I mean, we see that it's over and over again. Yeah. The sons of the king. Yeah. Get slaughtered. The, those well, especially for a usurper, meaning someone mm -hmm. who's 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 stealing mm -hmm. the um, authority that isn't really uh, doesn't have it coming. He's he's got a you know he doesn't have true legitimacy. So those who have other potential legitimacy, he's got to kill them. Mm. Wow. So it says here, surely Solomon, your son. It says, go into King David. Say to him, my lord the king, did you not swear to me, your servant? Surely Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Why then has Adonayahu, then I think it's entry, Bathsheba uses the shortened form. She doesn't use the long form. So she's, like, so she's talking to me like, hey, your son, you know, you know, Mike, <laughs> Adonayah, not Adonayahu. She uses the shortened form, okay, because this is the way they called him. They called him by the shortened form. Interestingly, when, they, yeah. when they're ready to proclaim him king, yeah. They don't use the shortened form. Mm -hmm. They use the long form. I'm making this up, folks. No, I'm reading it. It's just I'm just telling you. Bathsheba mm -hmm. uses the uh, the shortened form. Yeah. Not going to make a whole theology out of it. But I just think if you can find another example, we're in the same story. We mm -hmm. have two examples of the long form and the shortened form. And the reason I'm saying this that, is, yeah. from the from a formal standpoint, when it's time for him to do his proclamation, where they proclaim him, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Which form do they use? <laughs> yeah. Let's continue. So. 
I'm, and I want to get to that in the because I have a very controversial thing I want to ask you about. Oh, okay. Let me advise you, go unto the king, say this to him, verse 14. While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in and confirm what you have said. Now for a little conversation, verse yeah. 15. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room where Abishag, the, now here comes the Shunammite, was attending him. Nehemiah, yeah. same word. Now she comes in and she's attending him. I'm saying this. What was she atten- How was she attending? She was cuddling him. It no, was cold. I, I don't. It was body heat. Grow up. Okay, so she <laughs> comes in and the, and she has to uh, 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 make, make mention of a Bobby shot, who is ministering to the king, who's yeah. serving the king. Yeah. Maybe she's getting him water and tea. Maybe she's that, help. That, maybe she's ma- maybe on. she's doing. We heard what her purpose was. <laughs> Come on. I think Abby Shag is, is, is a nurse. I think she's doing more okay. for the king. This is just my in, in English. You have the word nurse. Doesn't okay, say that well, okay. She she was she was doing she was being a servant. <laughs> okay, so she does this. It says Bathsheba bowed low, knelt before the king, and he says, "What is it that you want?" The king asked. She said, "My lord, you yourself swore to me your servant." And I think it's interesting when Nathan says, "Go in and say to him, my lord the king, did you not swear to me your servant?" When she does it, she says. My Lord, you your swell swore to me. Yeah. And then what does it say? By Yehovah, by Yehovah. Okay, so meaning... Nishbata by Yehovah. You've sworn by Yehovah, your God. And how big of a deal is that? How that's many, a really big deal. What, what, meaning if you don't swear just pass something over by that, Yehovah... That's a big deal. What does that mean? Then, then that's binding upon you. You, mm-hmm. you can't annul that or, you know, um, get out of that. And her point was, you know, you, you, you swore. So... You know, I'm holding you to your word. You swore by Yehovah? By Yehovah, ah, yeah. I think that's, that's yeah. kind of... That's kind of... So, and it says here, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. Now, let's do something. Just historically, a little bit of context for people that don't realize. Um, can and, we do yeah. something? Can we just do well, something? Well, here, once again, we've got, you know, Adoniyahu and Adoni. Uh, there's this contrast, once again. Mm-hmm. There's your son, whose name is Adoniyahu, and then Adoni, my... My Lord, the King. Yeah. So when yeah. You, again, when you're reading that, make sure you bring that up. Yeah. Can we do a little context, a little history, a mm. little context? Sure. How big of a deal is it that David has this promised seed of Solomon? How mm. big of a deal is it for Bathsheba that it's her son mm-hmm. that's going to be this this promised seed? And can we? Could we just for a second? Would you be willing to go back to the promise that God gave David? In mm-hmm. other words, if just from a little bit of context. Why is this a big deal? This isn't just like, you know... Well, it's a big deal to her because she's going to die if she doesn't... If, if Adonijah becomes Why is king. it a big deal to the bigger story of... Uh, so so of, here's, of a really, here's a really interesting thing that I was talking to my friend Tim down in San Antonio, Texas. Hey, Tim. And um, he, he... I was talking to him just a few days ago and he pointed out to me. He said, um, he said you know, we really have a lot of information about David. Mm-hmm. And I thought about it. We, we know more about the life of David... About the uh, you know the um, adventures and challenges and and uh, and failings of David than we know about Moses, mm. than we know about Abraham, than mm. we know about uh, I mean maybe Jacob comes close or Joseph comes close, but really we know a lot more even about mm-hmm. about David than we do about Jacob or Joseph. I mean, so think about is there another biblical figure that we know about you know so many of his his ins failings and, outs and, and ins and, and outs yeah. and, and challenges with the family. And lifespan when yeah, there's a child. I mean, so, what, yeah. so we really <laughs> have a lot of information about David, and I and, and I think that's because David is a central figure in the Bible. Because mm-hmm. David begins the line of the kings, which ultimately will result in the final um, redemption with the King Messiah. Mm-hmm. And so this, so so that's why this is important. This is the, the succession, mm-hmm. meaning who comes after David isn't some trivial matter because the Messiah is going to be decided based on that that line. Mm-hmm. Who is it? So that's why I'll tell you, tell you for me, so when we were reading this this passage, what I wanted to do is I wanted to ask myself, okay, so why is this a big deal? And we're hearing the story about Abishag and keeping the king warm and this guy's a false king, whatever. But if the story goes different, then the promise ends. Yeah. I mean, the promise was for Solomon, for his right. son. Right. I mean, and so, so... So basically, we've got the promised king of the line of David... But then there's always this danger of the false king rising up and proclaiming himself king, and he's and he and maybe he has even some priests behind him, and maybe he's got some military might behind him. Come on, but he doesn't have the true 
um, the true right and legitimacy, and he doesn't have the prophet with him mm -hmm. to be the true king of the line of David. Amen. Amen. <laughs> That's what I wanted. Okay, so it says here, she said to him, my Lord, you swore this to me. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves, sheep, and has invited all the king's sons, the priest and Joab, the commander of the army, but he has not invited Solomon, your servant. My Lord, the king, the eyes of all of Israel are on you to learn from you who will sit on the throne of my Lord, the king, after him. Otherwise, as soon as my Lord, the king, is laid to rest with his fathers, I and my son Solomon will be treated as, and it says in the English here, as criminals. In other words, she, she's also reminding him, look, you've made this, sw you've sworn this. In the Hebrew this. it says chataim, sinners. <laughs> as sinners. Yeah. And what will be their sin? I guess their sin will be rebelling against the, the one who, who proclaims himself to be the true king. Mm -hmm. Even though he's not the true king, but he's the one with the power. So mm -hmm. they'll, be deemed, they'll be deemed sinners. Wow. And while she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet arrived. And they told the king, Nathan the prophet is here. So he went before the king and bowed with his face to the ground. Verse 24. And of course, we know the story of Nathan and the king. He shows up at significant times in his life mm -hmm. when he comes in. And, and Nathan, <laughs> I, can, can I say this? Yeah. He's, he's a little bit of a schemer. Yeah. Like he had a similar thing. Uh, it's almost the same story where he got a woman. Uh, the woman, if I believe she was from Tekoa. And he, you know, and he said to her, look, you've got to go tell the story to the king about a sheep. And you know that story. Hmm. And um, and then the king proclaims the judgment, and then Nathan shows up and says, "Hey, wait a minute! What you, you just are said? The, yeah, yeah, exactly. you're the man." Yeah. And, it's just, and, and and maybe that says something about Nathan and the, David and their relationship. That um, maybe he was afraid of David, I guess. <laughs> well, think about it. You're bringing the kind of <laughs> right, message bad of accountability, king, right? Or All right, but, but this is Yehovah speaking through him. Mm -hmm. But even so, he was afraid to come and bring that message to the mm -hmm. king. Mm -hmm. And we can see from you know stories about, for example, Jeremiah, where he got thrown into a you know a dungeon basically um, for doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I understand why he was afraid. Um, but you know, it, it's an interesting dynamic to have. <laughs> yeah. And that's actually Nehemiah why I brought that up earlier, just about the dynamic of the king and the people. When I hear yeah. about Joab, I think about what was what was their deal? You know, here's Nathan, what was their deal? His sons, Absalom, what was the deal? What was going on mm -hmm. with them and the things that happened? David is a complicated uh He's a complicated person, figure. Very complicated figure. I mean think about it. This is this is the true king of Israel and he's the, the forefather of the one who, in the end, will reign as the Messiah, who 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 brings say that brother peace to the entire world, where all mankind will come before his throne and profess his kingship. May it be soon, and um, and think about what we know about him. <laughs> he's not a perfect man in any no, sense. Any he's you know sinned. He's murdered. He's committed adultery. He's made a lot of mistakes, and um. But he had this faith and loyalty to Jehovah, and he was willing to change. He was willing to repent. Mm, and that's what the power of David, not that he's perfect, mm -hmm. but that he has a true heart for Jehovah and is willing to come to him in full repentance. May it be that we have a heart like that. Amen. So Nathan comes, as you mentioned, have you have my Lord the king declared that he shall be Adonai, Adonai Yahu, shall be king after you and that he will sit on your throne today he's gone down sacrifice great numbers hearing the story again now for the third time first we heard uh, uh, we heard Adonijahu do it then we heard uh, Nathan tell Bathsheba tell, that he did it then now did Nathan it. tell the king that he did it and, and we, Bathsheba told the king that he did it and now he's coming to confirm it again have yeah. you my lord done this today he's gone down sacrifice sheep he's invited all the king's sons the commanders of the army and the priests right now they are eating and drinking with him and saying and now I want you to take a look at what it says here <laughs> in Hebrew. This yeah. made me stop, yeah. Nehemiah, because when I heard what Nathan told David, this phrase, yeah. and then what I heard them say to him, it, yeah. it really made me stop. So, so could you do us a favor and just tell us what does the phrase say that Nathan is telling him that they're saying about the king? So he says, um, by Amruan, they said, and they said, meaning the people who are backing uh, Adoniahu, Yechi HaMelech Adoniahu. Long live King Adoniahu. And actually, it doesn't say long live. Yechi. May the King Adoniahu live. Mm, mm. And that's a really important phrase, this yes. Yechi. Yechi. May he live. And we'll see it in a minute when we get to the end. Yes. That this is what's proclaimed about David. Mm. <laughs> it's powerful. <laughs> so I saw that, and I have to be honest with you, when I saw that, I, I, I asked myself, if the people are saying this, what would be a modern-day example where someone would say, live, 
to a king. Yeah. Oh, I mean, you know, so in French you've got this expression, which I imagine comes from the Hebrew, perhaps, uh, where you say, like, you know, viva la so-and-so, viva mm-hmm. la revolution, long live the revolution. Mm-hmm. Well, the revolution isn't a thing that lives. It, it comes from this Hebrew, ancient Hebrew concept mm-hmm. that you're proclaiming the life of, of something or someone. Mm-hmm. So, tank, so in other words, in, in other words, well, okay, we're going to keep, we're going to keep developing because I, this, this phrase is what caught my attention. Mm-hmm. And it says, but me, your servant in Zadok, the priest in uh, Benaiah, son of Yehoiada, and your servant Solomon, he did not invite. Is this something my Lord, the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my Lord, the king after him? Then King David said, now, up until now, up until verse 28, we have not heard David say anything in this mm-hmm. whole chapter. Yeah. We, we've heard that he's got a, he's got a, he's got a, a Abishag, he's got a, a Shunammite, part, cuddle partner. <laughs> and he's got a, he's got a minister named Abishag the Shunammite, and he's got, he's got, his, he's got Bathsheba coming in, and yeah. Nathan coming in. He even has, it, 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 it seems to say that he's aware of the fact that his son is doing these things and not saying mm-hmm. anything about it. So, but we don't hear from him. And then when we finally hear him, I can kind of, I get this picture in Nehemiah. What was the thing that finally made David respond? Was it what they were saying? Long live King, or well, I should say, live uh, King Adonijah. Uh, was it that, that Bathsheba and, and Solomon were at risk for their lives? Was it that these, you know, it, whatever it is, something makes the king finally says, Call in Bathsheba. Mm-hmm. I mean, and which so, is interesting. It means that when Nathan came in, she was sent out. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so she's so first she comes in, she yeah. tells the story. She's out. Here yeah. comes the prophet. Well, and, and Nathan's point was, you know, if you go, if I come and say it to him, maybe he won't believe it. And if you go and say it to him, he won't believe. It. But if he hears it from two witnesses, he's going to believe it. There it is. <laughs> so she came into the king's presence and stood before him. The king then took an oath. It seems like he almost. And we have to stop. Yeah. We have to stop. I want us to break up this oath in Hebrew. The king then took an oath. And in English it says this. As surely as the Lord lives, as surely as Yehovah lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble, I will surely carry out today what I swore to you by him. So yeah. this, this idea that he's by the life of. Yeah. So he says, Ha Yehovah. Mm. As Yehovah lives, Asher padat nafshi mikol tzara, who redeemed my soul from all trouble, ki ka'asher nishbati lach by Yehovah as a Elohei Yisrael, as I have sworn to you by Yehovah the God of Israel, they more saying, ki Shlomo v'nechim lo chacharai, that Solomon your son will be king after me, v'hu yoshev al kisi tachtai, and he will sit on my throne after me, ki ken esa hayom azeh, for thus shall I do this very day. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's it's a it's really interesting. I love this phrase where he you know so he's swearing Chai Yehovah as Yehovah lives, and there's prophecies about that. Do we want to talk about that I, time or please? I mean, we have time. Okay. We have to I want, because I want to talk about the significance of that phrase. I love that phrase. Yes, Chai Yehovah. That's, it's, I mean, it's it, one of the most important yeah. phrases I think in, in Tanakh. Um, and we have it 43 times that people are swearing Chai Yehovah as Yehovah lives. Mm-hmm. Um, One Samuel fourteen thirty nine. There's an oath. Um, Says Ki Yehovah Hamoshia et Yisrael, for as Yehovah lives, the one who saves Israel, the Savior of Israel. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, and then there's a prophecy in Jeremiah twelve sixteen, and you know one of the th- I've talked about this before. One of the reasons this is a fascinating prophecy to me is most of the prophecies I think are directed at Israel. Yes. Whereas Jeremiah twelve sixteen is explicitly not directed at Israel. Mm-hmm. In Jeremiah twelve sixteen, he starts out in verse. Um, let's see. In verse 14, it says, Ko amal Yehovah al shkol shchenai haraim. Thus says Yehovah to all my evil neighbors, hanogim benachala shen chalti etami Yisrael, who, uh, who touch upon the, the inherited portion that I've given to my people Israel. So in other words, Israel's neighbors, the Gentiles. Mm. This is a prophecy to the Gentiles. Mm. And then he says in verse 16, he says, And it shall come to pass if they surely learn the way of my people, to swear in my name or by my name, Chai Yehovah, mm. as Yehovah lives. So if you learn to swear the way David swore, mm. to make an oath the way David made an oath, as Yehovah lives, and it says, as they taught my people to swear by Baal, because that's what they did, they would swear as Baal lives. Mm. 
It says, And they will be built in the midst of my people. Mm. So think about what an amazing promise that is to Jeremiah. Come on. This promise through Jeremiah to the nations of the world that if they learn to swear the way David swore, mm. then they will be built into the midst of Jehovah's people. They'll be oh, part man. of that, that Davidic heritage, that Davidic promise, the mm. promise to Israel. Uh, you know, we read in Isaiah mm. before about how the, you know, the, the covenant to Israel... There's a connection between that covenant to Israel and the loyal promises to David, the mm -hmm. faithful promises to David. Mm -hmm. And here we can see there's this oath that David made that many people, 43 times in the Tanakh is made mm -hmm. by different people. And if the, if the Gentiles will learn to swear that way, they'll be built in the well, midst of a, Israel. Which we, I want to just bring this up, Nehemiah, and this is, uh, you know, we're, we're some weeks into the process now. Yeah. But in the, in the Ten Commandments series, the third, the third thing is, to, the third series in the Scripture Bite series, the Scripture Bite series, mm -hmm. which at BFAinternational.com, the third series speaks about the fact that um, he says, you shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Mm -hmm. So it's talking about these, you talked about the Gentiles who yeah. learn to swear in his name, but yet in the general sense of how it's been taught, yeah. you stay as far away from God's name, not only in Jewish tradition, oh, yeah. but in the Christian tradition. So think would, about so, that. You would never, so I want to yeah. say this, I, I'm about to give you a chance for the ministry minute. Oh. But, but, but <laughs> what's, so, what's so exciting about this is that when you learn, when you're reading the scriptures and we see Hai Yehovah, and then you bring up the verse in Jeremiah that says, if I, as a Gentile, mm -hmm. will learn to yeah. swear in God's name, just yeah. like David did, yeah. then he'll build me up. But what's my learning? What, yeah. what is it that I learned? You stay away from the name, and certainly right. well, you, yeah. wouldn't, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, swear in his name. Yeah, so you know, that's one of the things that my people have, have we, we've sinned. Mm. We've turned the name of God, of the name of Yehovah, into, a, into this thing we're supposed to be afraid of. Mm -hmm. This thing we have to you know, stay as far away from as possible. Um, we've been, you know, and, I, and in my book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, I talk about this, that there really is a conspiracy of silence about God's name. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it's an open conspiracy, <laughs> mm -hmm. meaning that, that, that we must not speak this name. Uh, it's forbidden. It's too holy to pronounce. Um, it's, you know, too profound to know. And we read in ancient Hebrew and we see David swears, Chai Yehovah, as Yehovah lives. One of the things I talk about in that book, Shattering the Conspiracy of Silence, is there's this, this ancient Hebrew letter that was found in a place called Lachish. Mm -hmm. And I love it. It's one of the Lachish letters. And it's written in Paleo-Hebrew. And, and we can date it very precisely. It's from the Babylonian invasion mm -hmm. of Judea. Um, and it's this commander who's, who's you know, sending letters back. In one place, the guy says, Chai Yehovah, the same words that David said, the same words that Jeremiah taught that if the nations will learn, mm -hmm. they'll be built in the midst of Yehovah's people. But what's really cool about it in this um, ancient Hebrew letter from Lachish uh, in southern Israel is that he writes Chai Yehovah as Yehovah lives as one single word. Mm. And, it, and what scholars have come along and said is that this reflects the way people pronounced Hebrew. Mm -hmm. That it's kind of like an, it, it's what we would call in English a contraction. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we say do not yeah, and don't. then we'll say don't. Mm -hmm. And we'll even write it that way, don't. Well, Hebrew had a similar thing. And mm -hmm. so when they would say as Yehovah lives, it was such a common phrase. It was like, don't, isn't, mm -hmm. or ain't. Mm -hmm. And they would say, chai mm -hmm. They put write it as one word. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually tells you, uh, is, is a good clue about how the name was pronounced. Because mm -hmm. if it was chai Yahweh, well, that couldn't possibly to, be two, be one sing, uh, you know, contracted to one syllable in Hebrew. And this has to do with Hebrew grammar, that the Yud in Yehovah has a shva, and the shva is only a half vowel, so it can fall out. Mm -hmm. And and we have that we have for example Le Yerushalayim to Jerusalem is Le Yerushalayim and mm -hmm. it, this is grammar, um, but this is a standard rule in Hebrew that when you have this kind of structure with a shva the shva can fall out and you can say Chai Yehovah you can say Chai Hova. Well, I want to tell you Nehemiah, it's, it's interesting stuff. about what you just shared and you talked about it's just grammar, but that's one of the things that your ministry one of the things you have been doing in your life. Yeah. Is learning, so I want to take a minute. We're almost at the end here, but we yeah. can do it any time during the show. Sure, we've agreed that we're always going to each give each one a minute. I'll either let you go first or I'll go first. All right, well, I'll, I'll go first because um, I kind of started. <laughs> so my ministry is Macor Hebrew Foundation. Uh, my website's nehemiaswall.com, and you know what, what we've really been about is empowering people with information to defend the word of Yehovah and build their faith based on ancient Hebrew sources. And the reason I called it Nehemiah's Wall is there's that image of the people are up on the wall and they've got in one hand the, the tool to build and the other hand the tool to defend themselves. And, and, and what I've seen is the people have just been harassed and uh, you know um, given false information and I want to empower those people with that information to have the two tools in, you know, in their hands 
to build their faith and defend their faith. Mm -hmm. And and I'm not about tearing down anybody's faith. I really want to build your faith uh, in you know in in the truth based on ancient Hebrew sources. Mm -hmm. And even if you disagree with me mm -hmm. on certain important things, you need to be empowered. Yeah. And then I love this image. It then describes in Nehemiah in my book Nehemiah <laughs> how there are men with him on the wall who blow the trumpet. And you know I've started this thing called my raw stream of Torah consciousness, where I'm putting out the, these uh, special studies to my support team people who can you know sign up and uh, join the support team and those are the people who, who are standing with me on the wall to get this message out and I just want to send awesome. my thanks to those people awesome well uh, and again it's important to what you're doing because having the information oftentimes uh, at least for myself there just haven't been enough people that I'm around that have access to that kind of information so you say it's grammar I say that that's really important to understand how the language works oh, absolutely. so again for us for BFA international dot com you can go on the front page and you'll see two things that jump right off the page one is profit pearls which is what we're doing right now and the other is mm -hmm. scripture bites it's a 10 part series by now I'm sure we're in the series the week number uh, I believe it is week five and um what we're doing is we, we've decided that we want to provide the best information we can, information, inspiration, revelation, to inspire people around the world to build a biblical foundation for their faith. But I want to challenge some of you that are able to consider becoming the card of the Premium Content Library, and I'll tell you why. The Premium Content Library is a give and take. One, if you're a Premium Content Library member, it's a minimum $9.99 a, a month gives people access to everything we've done, including, I think the number is up like 40-some uh, television um, quality um, teachings on God's time, God's Torah, God's name. Um, those things have played all over the world, and now we make them available in the premium content library. But the other thing it does, Nehemia, and those that are listening, it helps us for the things that haven't been developed. One of the things that hasn't been developed is an amazing, amazing series that I actually did with Yehuda Glick uh, on his mission re regarding get, bringing people to the Temple Mount and the importance of the Temple Mount, and that's sitting on a camera that we can't even address until we can get enough resources. And so that's an example. If you sign up as a premium content member, you're helping us, we're helping you, and together if we can get enough people just doing a little, that's going to help us do a lot. And so there's a couple series like that that are just going to be, I think, that are going to be earth-shattering, they are going to be amazing for people. So if you'd be interested, please consider going to BFAinternational.com. Just sign into the Academy. You'll see a choice of free member or a premium content member. Free members get even more things than the general person, but the premium content folks are the people that are helping us, one, uh, prepare for the things that we have do and doing, and two, they get a chance to have access to absolutely everything. So please consider that. We need a whole lot of people to get that, uh, to, to do that, so that by the end of the year, we can start the year in producing some amazing series that we have that need to be developed. So that's it for me on my ministry minute. Now, Hemia, would you like to say anything else? I hope not. <laughs> I'm just kidding him. He is a uh, he's he's he really I have to say something about Nehemia for those that are considering to be in the support team. You know, he's in the process of developing not his ministry, but developing how he talks about it. His ministry has been going on for years. You've been doing amazing teachings, ri written articles that are available and and certainly the things we've done together where you've yeah. just raised the bar. But you haven't so much been dealing with the issue of resources. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy conversation for you. So I want to tell you, for those that are listening um Consider being a part of the support team. That's going to help you continue to do what you're doing, which is providing uh, the best information, I think, that's available for people to learn for themselves. Yeah. So that's my plug for you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, let's. We only got a verse left, and we're actually just about whoa, out of time. Whoa, whoa, wait a minute. No, we've we only got, got, to talk, verse... got to talk about verse 29. We're going to get to 29. We only no, go we to 30. We yeah, get I... Yehovah, as Yehovah lives. And go he ahead. Says, yep. He says there, um, Asher Pada. Oh, I lost my place who, who uh, uh, redeemed my soul from all uh, oh, trouble, and that and in e English maybe you can just you know gloss, yes, as the king said, gloss over that. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble, delivered me out of every trouble. So in Hebrew, the word is pada, which means redeemed, mm -hmm. and the image there is you know we ha actually have this this um, you know this image in the Tanakh of you know every firstborn belongs to Yehovah, mm -hmm. and they have to redeem him. They 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 you know do the five shekels to the the kohen. This word redeemed is somebody who is, um, you know, basically being bought out of, you know, some kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, a slave, for example, mm -hmm. can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. So, he, re Yehovah redeemed my soul. <laughs> That's a power. It, it's it's, it, I mean, the literal meaning has to do with you pay some kind of price mm -hmm. to get that, to get somebody out of something. And here, Yehovah paid the price to get my soul from all trouble. And Hebrew, this is a very unusual phrase. It only appears here in 1 Kings one twenty nine. 
uh, and in the Psalms. Mm -hmm. And specifically, it's often in the Psalms of David. So my favorite example here, I'll bring the clearest example, Psalm 34, verse 23, Mm -hmm. which in the English is verse 22 because you have different verse numbers. Mm -hmm. In the King James, it says, The Lord redeemeth the soul of his servants, and none of them that trust in him shall be desolate. And it's the same phrase. It says, Pode Yehovah nefesh avadav. Yehovah redeems the soul of his servants. And if you look at the beginning of that psalm, it is a psalm of David in a very specific situation. And so David, so, so this is like, this is Davidic terminology. This is like a, fr- a turn of phrase that David liked to use, mm. that David liked to use. And, and here he's using it in, in, like in daily life. He's dealing with this situation. Well, I, I'm calling this yeah. a pearl. And so yeah. I want this to be the word of the week. Okay. That actual word. I want you to teach yeah, the word. It. And then we're going to, we do have a couple verses that we go and I want to bring a story at the end that you're really going to appreciate. Okay. So the word is pada. It's a very easy word in Hebrew. Pe dalad he. Pada. And it means to, to redeem. And let me just give you a quick example of it. Um, and here, for example, um, well, I lo- we got to read this because this is, you know, this is a powerful thing. This is uh, Exodus 13, verse 13. And it says, And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. Same word, pada. Mm-hmm. You will pada with a lamb. And if you not redeem it, then you shall break his neck. And all the firstborn of man among your children shall you redeem. Again, pada. Mm-hmm. And then skip ahead to verse, uh, well, let's read it. Uh, and it and it shall be when your son asks you in time to come, saying, "What is this that you uh, shall say unto him?" By the strength of the hand, the hand of Jehovah, by the strength of hand, Jehovah brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it uh, came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that Jehovah slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn man and the firstborn beast. Therefore, I sacrifice to Jehovah all that opens the matrix, being males. But all the firstborns of my child, uh, children, I pada, I redeem. Mm. And so Yehovah redeems our souls from mm. trouble. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, I, if it's okay, um, we're, we, yeah. I want to end with a story that I think you're going to appreciate. Yeah. Um, there's a verse here. To, can I read the rest of the verse? It's, we go to 31. Go ahead. Okay. Read it. it says here, uh, it says here, Solomon, your son, shall be king after me. He will sit on my throne in my place. Then Bathsheba bowed low with her face to the ground, kneeling before the king and said, Now... May my Lord the King live forever. Well, That's what you, you want to gloss over that. No, I'm not going to gloss over it. I'm bringing it to the end. That's why I'm. <laughs> so now, tell, tell what it says. No, oh, so so she says here, Yehi Adoni Hamelach David LeOlam. May my Lord the King David live forever. Mm-hmm. So that I mean, that's that same word Yehi that the people had said about. Mm-hmm. Um, about about Adoniyahu, and here she's saying it about the king, and then she adds the word lit olam, which is the word we had before in our, mm-hmm. our word of the week, olam, mm-hmm. for uh, the universe forever. Mm-hmm. What does that mean? Mm-hmm. David's almost on his deathbed. I mean, he, he's he, he's mm-hmm. he's inches from death, and she's saying, "May he live forever." Mm-hmm. There's got to be something deeper in that. Oh, can, can, can I get excited? You know can I get excited can about I it? Tell you what I think. It is? What is it? What do you mean? Of course, she she knows also the promise. Amen. So by you doing this. Yeah. Your seed, the seed that's coming, the seed that will be mm-hmm. Leolam forever. May it be that the promise that God gave mm-hmm. you that I'm now fighting for with your son, who's going to be the next son, line all the way into the end. It's almost like she's saying, look, if we can get this done, if we can keep this line going the way it's supposed to, that seed will go forever. Mm-hmm. I mean, why not? I mean, it's I don't know, pretty powerful, at least for you and I sitting here today. We know that that seed from David Mm-hmm. From David to Solomon, and ultimately the king that will come, yeah. it comes from his seed. It's a, it's a forever, and, and and that's one way of looking at it. Yeah, sure. but I want I want to you know I don't think I'm going out on a limb by saying that she may have had something else in mind, mm. which is that she knew that there would be a day when, as it says in Daniel, many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth mm-hmm. shall arise, some for eternal life, mm-hmm. and this may be what she meant by saying to David, "May David live forever." Oh, wow. <laughs> May it be. Amen. Well, can we can uh, listen? I, we're at we're out of time, but I want to give you a chance to respond to something. Yeah. Uh, in December, some years ago, I had a very good friend named Reggie White, mm-hmm. who uh, who who passed on. And uh, the day before he passed on, he called me here at this house, and he, mm-hmm. he told me about a dream that he had. Mm-hmm. And when he's telling me about this dream, he said that he saw this word, mm-hmm. and uh, this word he spoke about was mm-hmm. he saying the word that he was redeemed. Mm-hmm. And um, and I remember him just being frantic about this. He's calling. He's calling me. I think he, the next day, and actually we talked about it. Mm-hmm. You, you were checking to see what it was. But 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 help refresh my memory. What do you remember? What verse? It, he didn't say it was a verse, mm. but he said that it was this word. 
Do you remember that? Yeah, it was the word pada. It mm-hmm. was a, a form of the word pada, the benoni pa'ul, for those mm-hmm. who know Hebrew. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and, it, and I believe it was, um, well, actually, it's a couple verses. Mm-hmm. But for example, uh, Isaiah 35 10, it mm-hmm. says, Updu, Updu ye Yehovah, those who are redeemed of Yehovah, mm-hmm. um, shall return. Here, let's re- read that in your King James, mm-hmm. just for fun. Uh, and the ransomed of the Lord. <laughs> That's how they translate the ransom. Mm-hmm. And it's not a bad translation because mm-hmm. ransom is you pay money. But mm-hmm. the word is redeemed, pada. Uh, the ransomed of Yehovah, the redeemed of Yehovah shall return and come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. And then the same exact words virtually appear in Isaiah fifty one eleven. Therefore, the, the redeemed of the Lord or the literally the um, ransomed of Yehovah shall return and come with singing and to Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their head, they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow, and mourning shall flee away. So it's essentially the same prophecy Mm. twice, Mm. two witnesses. And so think about that. The day before he passed away, Reggie sees these two words, these words, the ransomed of the Lord, the redeemed of Yehovah, Mm -hmm. and it's speaking about how they're going to come to Zion with song. Mm. And my prayer is that I have the opportunity one day in the future, perhaps in the far future, to come to Zion with song as one of the redeemed of Yehovah, and stand there shoulder to shoulder with Reggie White. Mm. Oh, Amen. Isn't it something that she was talking potentially about that mm-hmm. time? You know, Reggie had this dream, the same word. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he, he, he really was a great inspiration to me. Um, I Obviously, uh, I know he'd be excited about what we're doing with Prophet Pearls and the many things that we're doing because it gives chance for people to see God's language in its original language, history, and context, which he was desiring more than anything and was studying uh, diligently for yeah. that. So we bless uh, his memory. We bless his uh, family. And at this point, oh, Nehemiah, I'm going to have to end this. I know you'd like to go another 30 minutes, but we've <laughs> got to end this before we go <laughs> too far. Folks, we really do appreciate you listening. Make sure that you uh, visit NehemiahsWall.com. Take a look at all the things that he has provided there. BFAInternational.com. Take a look at what we have there and, and, and consider joining us as in our mission as we try to help people really around the world, as you mm-hmm. said, defend yeah. their faith. And we say inspiring people to build a biblical foundation for their faith. Until next time, keep reading, keep studying, keep watching. And would you do us this favor? Would you keep praying? Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening to Prophet Pearls with Nehemia Gordon and Keith Johnson. For more information, please visit Nehemiah's and bfainternational.com.